story of the brand is quintessentially the story of this, of this founding of youth quest, which is as old as humanity, the, the search for beauty, the search for youth. And I think that what's really beautiful about the story of SK2 is that it tells you it can be found in the most unexpected, humble place and, and still be so hard hitting and so powerful. I think the, the myth of eternal youth or the search for eternal youth is is profound in every culture in the world and I think the idea of this little girl going off to to find this magical place and, and, and instead discovering a different secret was something that I liked because it it, it, it allowed you know, the, the, that fantastical notion to exist in the story and I liked going on that journey with the, with, with the, the innocence of the child's eyes. It's the kind of story that probably fits him very well, which is something timeless and huge and big and epic to some extent, um, distilled into humanity, distilled into emotion and distilled into a true heart. It's great working with Tom. He's a fantastic visionary. Um, he has a brilliant eye for detail uh, and a fantastic retention of, of detail. We did an extensive uh, search, uh, a wonderful producer called Molly Pope, who um, really did an exhaustive search in Japan. We had multiple location scouts going all over Japan. And we ended up coming up to Yamagata province, which is in, in, to the north of Tokyo, about two and a half hours on the bullet train, where we found you know, some stunning um, temples set uh, up the sides of mountains with extraordinary staircases leading up to them which have provided the basis you know, for our journey in our village um, and very magical places to, to, to visit. I was very struck by them on the recce. We were very lucky to find the Kojima and Peru Museum, which is in Yonezawa, which is, was very, very beautiful and full of the original sort of 19th century tools um, and barrels, etc. And we, and we dressed that and that, that was a wonderful experience there. From the beginning I wanted to use Japanese cars, so we did um, auditions here uh, and found an extraordinary six-year-old girl called Miyu. We were shooting the grandmother scene and I would give her a number of notes and over a two-minute scene and she'd nail every single one. So she's you know, truly exceptional and you know, I, I hope she has a great future. I wanted a child who would remain childlike and have the freedom to move as a child and speak as a child and have that innocence. And in Miyu, I, I have that. I mean, even when you just ask her to run somewhere, she, she runs with this sort of amazing style that only a six-year-old would run in and they're so close to their imaginative life. The Japanese film crews are, are excellent. I mean, they have an amazing film culture. I, I as, a, as, a, as a little boy, was a huge Kurosawa fan and it's been a particular thrill to see uh, Kurosawa printed on apple boxes and the sides of trucks and, and, uh, and, and to see that the, the legend of Kurosawa still lives on. But Danny's got a wonderful eye and a wonderful temperament and um, one of the best DOPs in the world. So it was great to continue our collaboration. Uh, and we were talking about how interesting it was to shoot in Japan for the first time and, and to learn a, a different aesthetic in terms of the way we frame shots. So, so that's been a great journey. Interesting, even though it's short form, um, it's still the same sort of parameters as when you work on a film. Because you definitely get to use bits of equipment that you don't necessarily come across when you're working on films. Uh, a case in point, the, we've used a thing called an octocopter, which is a kind of small remote controlled helicopter with eight propellers. And that's allowed me to accomplish moves that I literally would never, have never been able to do before in my life. And so to try out that technology for the first time on this commercial has been very excited, exciting. Today we've had snow, rain, winds that are too strong to fly the little mini helicopter. I'm incredibly pleased that Michael Dan is on board to compose. I thought he did an extraordinary job uh, with Life of Pi, for which he's just won the Oscar, so fresh from that. I was very excited to, uh, to get the opportunity to, to work with you know, one of the world's best directors, one of the great storytellers. Michael's very deft at making music reflect uh, the edit. He has an amazing ability to, 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 to shape the music to the picture. One of the greatest rooms, if not the greatest room in the world to record music in. Abbey Road's particularly important to me because it's where I recorded the music for the King's Speech 
um, and it's it's a legendary recording studio where the Beatles worked, and and, and it's it's a wonderful moment when you see all these highly highly gifted musicians come together to create uh, music for the finished film. I think what we we wanted to capture was the sense of, of play, the playfulness of this little girl, the sense of, of youth and exploration, the idea of this world kind of opening up to her and also to us, uh, things that we've never seen before either. So that sense of freshness and, and energy, fun, and, and yeah, and it's also a sense of mystery and, and uh, you know, kind of this beautiful discovery. I think once you frame a story as a, as a child's fairy story or, or a myth told for a child, it gives you tremendous freedom. And um, what I like about the story is that the grandmother is asked about her hands and why they're different, and she has an opportunity to, to initiate the girl into the realities of aging and mortality, and she chooses not to do that directly or to, or to sort of spoil her, the illusions and innocence of youth, but to tell her a story through which she can learn that truth.